Praise the Lord for what we've heard so far. And um, I feel that the Lord has put something on my heart that's in line with what we've heard so far. It's uh, from Luke chapter 6, if you want to turn there. For whatever reason, the Lord's had me uh, stuck in Luke chapter 6 longer than, or maybe I'm ordinarily stuck in a passage. And so I feel um, there are a few things I'd like to share on the topic. Um, what I want to title, what I'd share is Guard Your Gospel. And I feel the Lord has spoken to me on that, so I'd like to share. But as we turn there, I'll ask you a question that's troubling me, or that's been troubling me as you turn to Luke chapter 6. And perhaps the children can also think about this question, because it's a searching question. It says there's a couple of things that we know in the Bible. One is that many times Jesus healed everyone who came to him. And he blessed people's hearts as he spoke, and he... Uh, fed them many times. You know, he fed 5,000 at one point. He fed 4,000 at another point. So that's one thing we we know is that in Israel, at the time of Jesus' life, lots of people were blessed by him. And then we also know that at his trial, when he was being tried before Pilate, it says that there was a crowd jeering, saying, crucify him. They had been stirred up. These people had been stirred up by the Pharisees. And The question that's been troubling me is, do I think, I'd invite you to consider, do you think that there were some people in that crowd who had been healed or fed or blessed by Jesus? Some people who had been healed or fed or blessed by Jesus, did they end up later saying, crucify him? I I think that sadly that there were many people who They're in this bloodthirsty crowd, and yet they had had their thirst quenched by Jesus at another time. And I see that that danger is a danger that plagues me today, for sure. If you look with me at Luke chapter 6, if you had a chance to turn there, in verse 19, it says there, all the people were trying to touch him. And earlier it says that there was a great throng of people, because power was coming from him and healing them all. And what spoke to me was, in this just a simple verse, is lots of people wanted to be healed by Jesus. But at the end of his life, very few people wanted to follow him. Very few. And um, the same was true if you look with me, maybe just hold your finger in Luke 6, because I want to stay there. But if you look with me at John chapter 6, Jesus says in John chapter 6 and verse 26, after he fed the multitude, John 6, 26, Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and you were filled. And so we see that there are a lot of people who seek Jesus for a lot of reasons in Luke 6 and in John chapter 6. But in the end, there's, there's not very many who want to go all the way with Jesus. A lot of people want a lot of things, but few want to go all the way. And I think it's very important to be honest about why we've come to Jesus whenever we come to Jesus. Jesus warned these people here in John chapter 6, at least be honest with me. I'll tell you, I know why you're here. Do you know why you're here? And I wonder if in Luke chapter 6, if he had had the freedom, maybe if he would have said the same thing. I know why you guys are here. You want to be healed. I believe that every reason that we might come to Jesus has been given to us by God as Brother Stanley said earlier, every scenario that we find ourselves in in our lives has been given to us by God. It could be sickness, as in Luke chapter 6. It could be hunger, as in John chapter 6. It could be any other trial, difficulty, you name it. It's been given to us so that we might come to Jesus. But the question is, what do we do after we come to Jesus? So we can think about our sicknesses are a reason to come to Jesus. Hunger is a reason to come to Jesus. Loneliness is a reason to come to Jesus. Fear is a reason to come to Jesus. And all of these things are good. Lord, I don't want to be lonely. I come to you. Lord, I'm afraid. I come to you. Lord, I'm sick. I come to you. Heartbreak is a reason to come to Jesus. Depression is a reason to come to Jesus. Disappointment, a difficult boss or child or spouse or self, (laughs) all these things, all good reasons to come to Jesus. But the question is, God had a purpose in bringing us to Jesus other than being healed of our sickness or our hunger 
or our loneliness or whatever else it is. But the question is, does the reason that God allowed this thing in our life result in what he wanted when he wanted to bring us to Jesus? What he wanted was, as we know, what's, what is our gospel? Jesus will save us from sin, period. He will save us from sin. Not he'll save us from sickness, not he'll save us from loneliness or from disappointment or from difficult bosses or anything like that. It's he'll save us from sin. But the question that I was asking myself as I thought about this throng of people shouting crucify him, many of whom probably had been healed by him is, is it possible for me to come to Jesus because of the thing the Lord's allowed my life to draw me to him and I leave being healed of my sickness, but I'm not a disciple? Is it possible to leave being filled from the hunger that I felt that drew me to Jesus, but I leave him and I'm not a disciple? If we leave Jesus after receiving whatever it was that draw, drew us to him, then our need hasn't accomplished what God intended. Because what God intended was that when we came to him, we'd stay with him. And that we would be delivered from our sin. And that we would be transformed into his likeness. And what we see in the case of these people in the crowd is there's a lot of people who are delivered from a lot of things, but they had no interest in following Jesus or being with him or being delivered from sin or being transformed into his likeness. And that is a real danger. I think it's important we can have our, as our testimony something that's, that's amazing that the Lord did. Maybe he healed us of some sickness or maybe he fed us in some way or maybe he brought us out of a disappointment. We can have that as our testimony in a way. And then what, and that's great. We should experience the Lord's real help in our lives all the time. But if we're not careful, we start to make the mistake of when we think, am I a disciple? We can, to answer that question, we can say, well, have I ever been healed? Well, he healed me that one time, so I must be. Or we can say, am I a disciple? Well, I was hungry that one time and he fed me, so I guess I'm a disciple. And we can mistake, what does it mean to be a disciple? If we just look in our past and see some problem that Jesus has solved, that doesn't mean that we're disciples. It says that God causes his reign to fall on the just and the wicked later. God is merciful or kind, as it says in verse 35, he's kind to ungrateful and evil men. So if we've, if we've experienced kindness from God, does that make us a disciple? Not necessarily. What's the difference between people who are healed of their sickness or healed of their hunger or healed of whatever it is that brought them to Jesus, but leave and disciples? What's the difference? Well, if you look with me at Luke chapter six, it says in the next verse, in verse 20, that <clears throat> Jesus turns his gaze to his disciples so he looks away from all the people that he healed and he turns and he looks at his disciples. And look at what he says. And really think about this in the context of a lot of people who had a real need had just been healed. Jesus turns from people who had a real need and whom he helped, who God brought to him somehow. And then he turns to his disciples and here, listen to what he says. Listen in that sense. Blessed are you when you're poor because yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when you hunger now, because you'll be satisfied. Blessed are you when you weep now, because you'll laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize you and insult you and scorn your name. He's pointing out all sorts of things that people might reasonably expect to be delivered from. We could read all of those things and say, that's why I came to Jesus, because I didn't want to be poor. Or I didn't want to be hungry. I didn't want to weep. I didn't want to be hated or ostracized or insulted or scorned. I don't want those things. And Jesus takes all the things, you put sick in there, put anything in there, any reason, he takes all the things that we might come to him for and he says, I want you to stop thinking of these things as curses and I want you to think of them as a blessing. The things that you want to avoid are not bad. They're a blessing. He wants to totally change our way of thinking. And then look with me at verse 27. He says, I say to you who hear, Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Remember, he's talking to disciples. And, and to his disciples, what he says is not, just like he just healed them of their sickness, he doesn't say, and next, for my next act, you know, he's just healed all these people. And now for my next act, 
I'm going to get rid of all your enemies. No, he, that's not what he says. He says, you're going to have enemies and you're going to have people who ostracize you. And I haven't come to eliminate your enemies. I haven't come to eliminate other people's hate or ostracism or anything like that. That's not why I've come. I'm not going to take away your enemies. And to me, that, what that spoke was it's a radical difference to the old covenant. Think about in the old covenant, you just have to almost randomly turn to any psalm and you see David, who is a man after God's own heart, saying, smite my enemies, get rid of them. And that's an old covenant heart. I can expect to be delivered from my enemies. And yet what Jesus says to his disciples is, you're going to have enemies and you're going to have people who hate you. Are you. Were you expecting my next act to be getting rid of those people? I'm not going to do that. That's not, and that's not what a disciple seeks. And to me, what it spoke to is we have to really guard what we consider to be the gospel in our lives. I said I would title this message, Guard Your Gospel. The question is for me and for you is what do I call the gospel? What is my hope? What's my gospel hope? And it's revealed in these different situations. And it's revealed for these people who are sick. Their gospel hope was, he will deliver you from your sickness. And what Jesus does is he turns from them and he talks to the disciples and he says, far from being delivered from all the things you might ask, I, <clears throat> I want to tell you those are blessings. That's a disciple's mindset. Don't think I came for the reason that I, the people in the old Testament expected me to come. Think about John the Baptist. Again, if you hold your hand in Luke 6, but if you want to turn to Matthew chapter 11, Jesus tells us elsewhere that John the Baptist, or maybe even in this chapter later, actually, but in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus, I think, it says that he's the greatest of all Old Testament saints. But what was John the Baptist's gospel? And think about who John the Baptist is. Here's a quick, here's a quick um, biography or his resume. Pre-birth, leapt while I was in my mother's womb at the coming of the Messiah. Does anybody have something that happens before they were born on their resume? John gets one, right? He leapt in his mother's womb. He preached many sermons and drew many people to repentance. He baptized many people. He baptized Jesus himself. He stood on the shores and he told his disciples, you guys follow that one. Don't follow me anymore. This guy's got an incredible resume. And yet, look at Matthew chapter 11 and verse 2. It says, when John, while imprisoned, you could say, while people were hating him, while people were ostracizing him, while he was, in Jesus' words, being blessed, when he heard of the works of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and he said to Jesus, are you the expected one or should we look for someone else? That's his gospel. What's, Jesus, what's John the Baptist's gospel? The greatest of all the old covenant saints. Jesus Christ will save me from my enemies. And you could replace enemies with difficulty. Jesus Christ will save me from my disappointments. Jesus Christ will save me from my sickness, whatever. He did not have this, the light that we have today. We don't have to despise him or look down on him. But look at what Jesus says. Or maybe just pause for a second before we see what Jesus says. Think about the example that Brother Stanley gave us a second ago. He talked about Paul and Silas in jail. They're basically experiencing the same thing. John the Baptist is in jail. What does he say? Are you really the Messiah? Because if you were, I don't think I'd be here much longer. But look at, uh, look at um, Acts chapter 16. Now I'm holding my finger in two places, Matthew 11 and Luke 6. I apologize. <laughs> But Acts 16, in verse uh, 22, it says, The crowd rose up against Paul and Silas, and the chief magistrates tore their robes off and allowed them to be beaten with rods. And when they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, and they commanded the jailer to guard them securely. And having received such a command, he threw them into the inner prison, like solitary confinement, and he fastened their feet in the stocks. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening. They were praising God. They didn't say, hey, where's the Messiah? Where's our help? They were praising God. This is a radically different picture than we have of John the Baptist. These brothers are triumphant in their chains and their gospel isn't he's going to deliver us from prison, but it's he's going to deliver us from sin in prison. 
Sin will not be master of us, over us even in prison. And look at verse 30. This is amazing. Or, or verse, sorry, um, verse 27. It says, the jailer woke up. After their prayers, there was an earthquake. You would think, wow, sure sign that it's time for them to escape. The jailer woke up and he saw the prison doors were open and he was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, don't harm yourself, we'll, we're all here. And then verse 30, he says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And you know what I took from that? You guys are clearly saved. You weren't delivered from prison, but your salvation is so evident. What do I have to do to be saved? You're saved. Right? How, how, was the, how was their salvation manifested? It wasn't in being delivered from prison. It was their praise in prison. And that and the jailer, so much so that when the prison doors were open, they go, it's not totally clear yet whether we should leave. You know, we all go, oh, for sure. Get out of here. Come on, come on, come on. They're like, well, until the, we heard that an angel led Peter out. I don't see an angel. Maybe we should wait. I don't know what they were thinking, right? But the point is that there was some testimony there that was irrefutable even to a Roman guard. He said, that's the kind of salvation I want. I don't, I don't want the salvation where somebody gets released. I want the salvation where they have already been released in their spirits. That's true salvation. What did Jesus say to John in the Baptist in Matthew chapter 11? He says, in verse four, Jesus answered and said to John's disciples, go report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Am I the expected one? The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up. The poor have the gospel preached to them. I am the expected one, John. And blessed is the one who doesn't take offense at me. Don't expect my gospel to be, I'm going to release you from prison, John. And don't be offended by that. I am certainly the Messiah, but my gospel is bigger even than what you have conceived of as the greatest of all old covenant saints. I don't deliver, I'm not going to deliver you from prison or from death. That's not the good news. The good news is you're going to be blessed if, that's, if that doesn't trouble you, if that doesn't ca- cause you to stumble, if it doesn't cause you to doubt my love. That's what Jesus said to John the Baptist. Take care, if I think about this idea of guarding my gospel, take care that the true Messiah doesn't defend me. The one who isn't going to deliver me from prison, but wants to deliver me in prison, doesn't offend me because I don't like prison that much. And there's a temptation to be offended by our prison cells, whatever they are, or by our sickness, or by our hunger, or by our fill in the blank. And what is Jesus' word to someone who's a new covenant disciple? Blessed is the one who doesn't take offense at me. Don't be offended by these circumstances, as we heard from Stanley. These scenarios in my life, which are meant to manifest the glory of God, every bit as much as that stone in front of the tomb. Don't be offended by these circumstances. Who should be concerned? If we shouldn't be bothered, what I, the, the sum roughly of what I've been saying is don't be bothered by your trials. If we shouldn't be bothered by our trials, what should we be bothered by? If we go back to Luke chapter 6 and verse 24, Jesus has just been saying who's blessed. It's the person who has all the things that they thought they were going to come to Jesus to get delivered from. And then in verse 24, he says, woe, woe to who? Woe to you who are rich because you're receiving your comfort in full. Woe to you who are well fed now, you're gonna be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, you shall mourn and weep in the future. Woe to you when men speak well of you. All the things we think are a sign of God's blessing. Jesus says, be careful. That's not a mark that God's happy with you. And that's not evidence that you're experiencing the true gospel. Don't look at my life and see if people speak well of me and go, wow, I must be experiencing the fullness of the gospel. Don't do that. Just like I don't look at my life and see if I'm poor or facing difficulty and say, are you the expected one or should I, should I look for another? And what God says here is we've got, don't be concerned about the time of trial. Be concerned about the time of peace. 
And I feel this is a very important word to us in, in America, in the Bay Area and Silicon Valley. We've got to be concerned about the time of peace because in trials, we can be sure God wants to shape us. He wants to mold us. He wants to make us more like Jesus. But throughout the Old Testament, especially, you know, there's this phrase in in, uh, Judges, for example, it says, as soon as they had rest, they did evil before him. And I wonder whether that can be said of us. As soon as they had rest, as soon as they got delivered from the thing that they came to Jesus for help with, they did evil again. It's a great danger to us that when, if, we're, if we're oriented around or we're comfortable in all of our comfort, we're in great danger. We live in a time of great ease and comfort, and we know God can only give his grace to the humble. So how does he keep us humble? He allows us to go through all sorts of hard pressings and difficulties and trials, not because we're not experiencing the gospel, but because he wants us to experience the gospel. He wants us to receive grace. It's amazing to think about how the Apostle Paul, just think with me for a moment, did anyone have a better intellectual appreciation for hum- of the virtue of humility than the Apostle Paul? Could anyone have written more eloquently on the subject than Paul? He clearly understood the need for humility, and yet to him was given a thorn in the flesh that he beseeched the Lord, let this pass from me. And yet the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. Then what, what was the Lord doing with Paul? He wanted to take his intellectual theory or theology of humility. He wanted to turn it, he, made, he wanted the word to become flesh. He wanted Paul to be actually humble, not just appreciate the value of humility. And those are very different things. And in the midst of our ease and comfort and, and prosperity, we can intellectually appreciate all sorts of truths that we aren't experiencing that aren't a reality in our lives, that our hearts can burn as we heard. And we go, ooh, doesn't it feel good to have my heart burn? No, not if it doesn't result in fruit being produced, the fruit of Christ's likeness in our lives, the fruit of doing the word that we hear. And we have to be very careful in this time of, you know, a question that the, uh, the Lord has asked me is, would you rather, what would you rather? Would you rather have an easy way and remain proud Or would you rather have a very hard go at things, but be emptied of pride? Would you rather be delivered of sickness and leave Jesus? Or would you rather Jesus use sickness to keep me close to him? Use hunger to keep me close to him. Use a difficult boss to keep me close to him. Use loneliness to keep me close to him. The gospel is I get to be a friend of Jesus Christ. What keeps me from friendship? My sin. How does he eliminate it? He brings me through these situations that are sifting and trying situations where I can be delivered from my pride, from all of the things that keep me from him. But the question is, do I value closeness to Jesus Christ most of all? And a lot of times in the midst of the prison cell, I find myself more like John the Baptist. Are you the Messiah? This wasn't in the marketing pamphlet for discipleship. This wasn't in the brochure about the, the, the prison. That's how, that's how I can find my flesh responding. This isn't what I signed up for. And Jesus says the same words to me that he says to John the Baptist. You're blessed if you're not offended by me. I'm not talking about the prison. I'm talking about delivering you in the prison. I want to deliver you from self-pity and discouragement and all of the things that, that you need to be delivered from in this fr- prison. Trust me. It's what the Lord says, trust me. Here's an incredible promise if you turn back to Luke chapter six with me. An incredible promise and a hope that the Lord has put on my heart. Because yes, we have enemies, we have haters, we have cursors, we have despisers, etc. And unlike the old covenant saints, we have no promise of protection from them. You know, the old covenant saints were assured they're gonna be wiped out of the land. Jesus Christ does not assure us that anybody who hates us is going to be wiped out of our land, so to speak. But we get something better. Look with me at Luke chapter six, verse 35. Here's what Jesus says. Love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great. Here it is. You will be sons of the most high, who also is kind to ungrateful and evil men. 
You'll get to be called sons. That's the good news. You get to be called sons, children of God. What is a son? What is a daughter? But someone who has become like his father. And how is it with God? Does he not have any enemies? No, he has enemies. So if I'm going to become a son of God, should I expect that I have? To, I don't, I get more than he gets because he's got enemies, but I go, no, 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 I want the plan without enemies. No, that's not the way, right? The, the, he's let the devil live for thousands of years. That's incredible, right? One of the most unfathomable demonstrations of the humility of God is that the devil still exists. But God himself is totally unstained. He's totally pure, despite the fact that he's got this antagonist constantly trying to mess up all of his best laid plans. He's totally unstained by resentment or by anything. He demonstrates immense patience towards the evil people and the undeserving men, as we see here. The idea in the Old Testament that God's glory would be seen in the total outward victory of his people is no longer true. That's the Old Testament idea. God's glory, as we heard from Stanley earlier, would be seen in an outward victory. That's the Old Testament glory that we saw. What is the New Testament glory? It's that his glory would be seen in the total inward transformation of disciples into the likeness of Jesus Christ. I have to be careful to guard this gospel because as I live in this world and in the circumstances that I do and the comfort and ease that I do and all of those things, if I'm not attentive, if I'm not jealously guarding my gospel, I start to think, no, 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 it's gotta be in the total defeat of the outward circumstances that I'm in, rather than in the total transformation of my inner man into the likeness of Jesus Christ in the midst of a sinful world, not removed from a sinful world, but in the midst of it. I wanted to highlight one phrase in Luke chapter six, verse 35 in particular, because the Lord's stopped me here. This is a phrase that's continued to minister to me. It says in verse 35, love your enemies and do good and lend. This is the phrase, expecting nothing in return. And then you will be sons. You, you wanna hold on to the promise that you're gonna be transformed into my likeness. It's not enough to do good to your enemies if you're expecting them to turn around and do good to you. That's what that verse has spoken to me, that phrase. You have to get to the point where you're loving your enemies and you're not hoping they return the favor. And I find my love is often motivated by, is he gonna love me back now? I just demonstrated unfathomable patience. Are you gonna be patient with me now? And I get discouraged, I get disappointed. And the Lord's crushing that out of me. Don't have any subtle desire for kindness in return. Be kind, not because of what it does in someone else, but because God is kind for his sake, not because I want others to be kind to me. The other thing about that phrase, by the way, is in the margin, if you, I don't know about your Bible, in my Bible, the margin of verse 35 says, love your enemies and do good and lend, not despairing at all. Don't despair at all. Meaning don't get tired of it. Don't think, what good is this? I keep loving this person who's being evil to me and God's promised me I'm gonna, but what good is it? Don't even grow a little bit discouraged is what the Lord has spoken to me. Don't let your hope flag. Keep loving enemies. Keep doing good without discouragement. At the proper time, God's gonna lift you up. God's gonna turn you into a son. It says actually in verse 36 in the margin, it says be merciful here, but in the margin it says become merciful. I like that saying the Lord, even the Lord acknowledges, this is a process. I want you to become like I am. It's not gonna happen overnight, but that's why I'm giving you lots of at-bats. How do you get good at a sport? You know, you're in the batting cage. You go to the batting cage a lot, right? You need to keep seeing different kinds of pitches. You need to keep seeing different kinds of serves. When I play one of you many brothers in, in ping pong, I need to see lots of your serves over just to be able to read it. Don't grow weary. You're going to start to read the serve. You're going to start to learn how to respond in a manner that honors the Lord. Not despairing at all has really challenged me because it shows me how easily I give up. I tried loving him for a day and it didn't work. So, and the Lord says, no, 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 no. Day after day after day. This is how the Lord, this is how your father in heaven does it. Don't despair at all. Don't give up. Don't slow down even a little bit.
And I'll end with this verse. And um, if you want to put it up on the screen, Prime, do you mind? In Galatians 6, 9, it says, Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we don't grow weary. And I like to put this verse together with uh, the verse that I just read. This has been kind of a mashup of two verses between Luke 6, 35 and Galatians 6, 9. Here's, what I, here's, how, here's how I took it for myself. Is it up? Yeah. Thanks. Love your enemies and do good and lend, not despairing at all. Don't lose heart in doing good because in due time you will reap a great reward if you don't grow weary. Your reward, you'll be sons of the Most High who himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. So I believe this is something that the Lord is um, still working in me, but I want to participate with him in the process. I want to stop having the attitude like John the Baptist of when are you going to deliver me from my external circumstances and start having the attitude of Paul and Silas of being delivered, of living as one delivered, trusting that the Lord is able to accomplish the full purpose of his gospel. When he's brought me into circumstances, he brought me to them to come to him. But the reason I come to him is not to be rid of my circumstances, but to be rid of the sin that those circumstances stir up. And I believe that if I don't grow weary, that in due time, I will reap the greatest reward of all, which is that I get to be like Jesus himself. And uh, thank God that he knows it's a process. He's training me and teaching me that I need to remember it's a process too. But I believe the Lord will accomplish his purpose. Amen.